here is the colloquium dinner at Mirabel Tavern, and I'll take account, it's subsidized dinner at Mirabel Tavern, so I'll take account of people who are interested in active health. All right, thanks, Rob. Uh, if anyone's wondering like what this picture is that I have on uh, beginning of these lectures, it's it's not directly related to the lecture, um, but this is actually a, a picture of uh, a lamination in the plane. So you take a, a French braid, and you take a curve on um, in the complement of three points, and you you um, you look at the at the braid that those points form under some motions in the plane, and look at the image of the curve. And if you iterate that curve a few times, then um, it converges to this lamination that um, I, that I drew using. Um, so I took a geodesic in the universal cover, which is hyperbolic plane, uh, in the complement of these three points in the plane, and um, projected that down by some sort of Jacobi theta function or something, and and then drew this picture. So this is this is like a geodesic representative of the picture that uh, that Dennis and um, and Bill drew on the walls at Berkeley one uh, years back, and it's, it's on the poster in the, for the Cornell um, conference. But this is the this is the hyperbolic version of that. I, I guess I had heard a, a story that that Bill had tried to print one of these on a on a printer once, and came up with the notion of a train track out of that because the um, even though this is a curve, the the various um, uh, strands sort of come together and merge and and um, come apart again like a like a train track does and I think but I don't know if that's if that's true or not anyways that's uh, sort of an aside so uh, so the goal of this lecture is to explain some geometric group theory um, in order to um, <clears throat> understand these questions of Thurston that I explained in the last lecture so I'm not going to um, talk about these for the for the first part of the lecture for the most part. Um, I wanted to describe a couple more properties of three manifold groups, or actually they're properties of groups in general um, that hold in some cases for in three-dimensional case. So um, the so the first part I'll talk about some group properties and then connections between the group properties and these properties of finite covering spaces of three manifolds that are Related to Thurston's questions, so virtual property means it holds cover. Yeah, virtual property means it holds some property that holds. If it holds virtually, that means it holds for some finite sheet of covering space. Okay. For some. For some, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and then, um, and then I'll start talking about geometric group theory, in particular about hyperbolic groups and Katzer cube complexes, which were notions introduced by Gromov, and then about right-angled Artin groups and um, special cube complexes, which are um, related to these cube complexes. <clears throat> and then uh, by the end, I should be able to explain uh, Wise's conjecture, or at least state Wise's conjecture. And then that, the goal of the third talk will be to explain some aspects of the ingredients of uh, the proof of Wise's conjecture. Does cube mean n cube or three cube? An n cube, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so first uh, I want to talk about a few properties of groups. So residual finiteness. Um, so a group is residually finite. If any non-trivial element, there's a finite group and a quotient um, <clears throat> or a homomorphism from the group G to the finite group K such that uh, that element is not equal to the identity. So you can separate any element from the identity in some finite quotient. Uh, another way of describing it is if you take the intersection over all the fine index subgroups of G, um, then you get the trivial subgroup. It's the simplest group that you know of that doesn't have any homomorphisms to a finite group. Uh, yeah, the Higman group is a good one. Uh, oh, so, yeah. Um, Hig Higman was, as far as I know, the first one to construct. Yeah, so there's, um, you, you know, the bombslug solitar relations? The bombslug solitar? Well, names. I just told you. Yeah, okay. So, um, so you, t you take a group that conjugates like A. Uh, a conjugated by B is, is A squared, and then um, B conjugated by C is, is B squared, and then C conjugated by D is C squared, and D conjugated by A is D squared. That group has no, that has no finite quotient. Yeah, four times you need to go. If you do it twice, you get the trivial group. If you do it four times, you get a group that has no finite quotients. Infinite group, yeah. 
<clears throat> yes, that was Higman. And then some general nonsense says that there's a simple, there's a um, simple quotient of that. You take a maximal subgroup, maximal normal subgroup, and then the quotient of that will be, um, will be simple because it can't be finite. So uh, examples include uh, of residually finite groups that include finitely generated linear groups. Uh, that was proved by Malchev. So by a, a linear group, I just mean a subgroup of GLNC for some, um, for some n. Um, and then three manifold groups. So um, this, this actually might be a special case of this observation, but it's still not known whether uh, three manifold groups are, I should say, again, finally generated, whether th finally generated three manifold groups in general are, are not known to be linear. So uh, this, this class of graph manifolds that I mentioned yesterday um, is in general still not known to be um, linear. But almost all, uh, all the other cases are, are now known to be linear. But anyways, this was proved by Hempel in 84 um, as it, as, that it's a consequence of the geometrization theorem. So Basically, the geometrization theorem says that any three-manifold has this decomposition into pieces that have a um, linear fundamental group. And um, you can sort of piece together the finite representations on those pieces across the tori to get the um, finite <coughs> quotients of the, of the entire three-manifold group. That's sort of roughly the idea. And then mapping class groups of surfaces. If you're familiar with that, then... Um, that's an example. These are outer automorphism groups of the fundamental group of a surface. <clears throat> so that was proved by Grossman. So, okay, so that's uh, residual fineness. And so residual, if you're going to talk about covering spaces, finite sheet of covering spaces of three manifolds, then, um, <clears throat> well, if you want to get any finite sheet of cover, then you better have um, some kind of residual fineness. And so in particular, since three manifold groups are residually finite, then at least that provides us with lots of covering spaces. So to answer Thurston's theorems as questions, then we want to um, understand these covering spaces, whether we can get covers, say, with positive Bay number or which fiber of a circle or, or whatnot. Um, the difficulty, though, with uh, the, the proofs of um, residual fineness coming from Hempel and, um, or from linearity is that um, in general, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily seem to be good at producing uh, positive first band number and finite sheet of covering spaces. There are conjectures that for certain classes of three-manifold groups, namely arithmetic ones, there's conjectures in number theory, namely Langland's functoriality, that would imply that there's covering spaces that have positive first band number coming from these sorts of constructions uh, from certain automorphic forms that are conjectured to exist. But those, those conjectures are still wide open in the cases that would be needed in the three-manifold case. So in general, it doesn't seem that linearity necessarily helps you that much uh, with Thurston's questions. Now, um, I want to discuss a little more of this uh, local extended residual fineness that I mentioned yesterday. And, um, and I, I sort of gave a picture explanation of what it means. So I wanted to give a more precise definition so a, a subgroup L of a group G is separable if for any element G that's not an L, there is a homomorphism in the finite group such that the image of G is not contained in the image of L. So you can separate G from the subgroup L in some finite quotient. So um, another way of saying this is that if you intersect all the finite index subgroups of G that contain L, that intersection is actually equal to L. This has um, other, uh, <clears throat> other terms. Closed in the profinite topology is something you might hear if, um, means subgroup separable. <clears throat> so residual fineness then means that the identity element, or the, um, the trivial subgroup, is, um, is separable in G, because then it's the inter intersection over all finite index subgroups. So this is an extension of residual fineness, because it, um, it's extending the fact that the trivial subgroup is separable in a residually finite group. Well, the, the fact that every finitely generated subgroup is this, is an extension of residual finite. That's right, yeah. <laughs> you didn't say that. You said oh, that. yeah, you're right, yeah. This definition, yeah. Yeah, and I think I mentioned yesterday that, yeah, you don't, the, the reason we assume local is that um, it's too strong a property for most groups. Um, 
it's too strong a property to, hold, to expect to hold for infinitely generated subgroups because you have most infinite or lots of infinite groups have lots of um, simple quotients, and the kernel will be infinitely generated and not separable. So that's why we need to generally assume finitely generated. So as an example, uh, recall if we had a, a three manifold five ring over the circle, um, then there's an exact sequence. The fundamental group surjects the fundamental group of the circle, which is Z, and the kernel is the fundamental group of the surface, which is a finally generated subgroup. And um, that subgroup is separable because it's the intersection, well, Z itself is residually finite, so the kernel of some homomorphism in the residually finite group is always going to be subgroup separable because it's, you intersect you intersect finite index subgroups of the image group, and the intersection will just be the kernel. So in this case, we intersect over inverse images of NZ, and the intersection will be the fundamental group of that surface. So this shows how um, these fibers of vibrations are going to give you separable subgroups. In particular, uh, what I stated yesterday is geometrically infinite subgroups of three manifold groups are fibers of, of vibrations of finite cheated covers and for that reason, th those actually are separable subgroups. So this argument is, um, is one case that's used in proving that three manifold groups are locally extended residually finite. So the case that needs to be dealt with then is the case of the geometrically finite groups, which is um, <clears throat> what, what is dealt with in, in Donnie Wise's work. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, subgroup separability allows you, so for topologists, it, the interest is in, allows you to take something that's immersed and find a finite sheeted covering space that's, that's an embedding. So, for example, if we had a surface and a, sur and a circle on it that has a self-intersection, well, Peter Scott proved that surface groups are, are LERF. In particular, the cyclic subgroup here is separable. And that means you can find a finite sheet of covering space which gets rid of that self-intersection. You see now there's two components here, and each component itself is embedded. And this is essentially, being able to do this is essentially equivalent to the subgroup being separable. And I actually took this picture from a, uh, an article oh, that's associated to the, the cyclic subgroup of the, that's generated by this loop. <clears throat> That, that's separable from Scott's theorem. Uh, this picture is actually from a paper uh, that was published by the, the, Science, the, the Simons Institute magazine uh, by Erica Clark that's describing some of this work. Okay, so um, subgroup separability means the subgroup is separable. Locally extended residual finite, that means that finally generated subgroups are separable. <clears throat> so, um, Clark, yeah, she was a she was a student of Minsky. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. What's it? Her last name is Clark, right? Oh, oh, sorry, I don't. Yeah, I'm probably mispronouncing it. She lives in Berkeley now, though. Um, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> examples include um, z to the n. Uh, any, any, any subgroup of that, this is actually finitely generated. In fact, um, groups that have uh, all subgroups finitely generated are fairly, um, fairly rare, actually. <clears throat> uh, then there's free groups. This was a classic result of Hall. Um, in some sense, uh, Wise's work is, a, is sort of a vast generalization of, uh, of Hall's technique. Um, and then surface subgroups um, <clears throat> was proved by Scott in the 70s. Uh, doubles of free groups uh, was proved by um, Jiddick and Rips. So um, double of free group is you take a free group and you take a certain subgroups and you take two copies of that free group and you, um, you glue them together along that subgroup, a so-called amalgamated product, which I'll describe in a little bit, what, or in the next lecture, what amalgamated products are. Um, but anyways, so there's, uh, there's been a fair amount of work on this topic, and um, myself, Long and Reed, uh, proved this for the Bianchi groups um, and certain other arithmetic groups, including the cipher weber dodecahedral space example that I gave yesterday, and the figure eight knot complement um, was 
uh, followed from, from this, but also from work of, of Wise. And then three-dimensional hyperbolic reflection groups uh, was worked out by Hagelin and Wise. So um, Thurston's question number 15 in his list was whether Kleinian groups are LERF. Kleinian groups are finely generated sub discrete subgroups of PSL2C. So um, that's some progress, uh, previous progress that was made on this, on this question. And as I explained last time, is related to the question of whether you have an immersed surface, such as Kahn and Markovich provide you, whether you can lift it to an embedding in a finite sheet of covering space. <clears throat> okay, so uh, one last group theoretic definition um, I wanted to state um, <clears throat> is a, a very strong form of <coughs> residual finiteness. So um, I call a group residually finite, rational, soluble, or um, like or reefers for short. If there's a sequence of subgroups, G naught, G one, G two, of finite index whose intersection is trivial, this is called a co-final sequence, but, um, and they're all finite index subgroup in, of G, and each one is obtained from, um, so GI plus one is obtained from GI as a finite index subgroup where you, you map GI first to Z to the K for some K, and then to a finite quotient, Z mod N to the K, and you take the kernel of that, so this will be an abelian cover, uh, sorry, this will be um, the quotient group, GI mod GI plus one, then will be, correspond to a subgroup of Z mod N to the K, it'll, it'll correspond to an abelian quotient. Um, we can actually assume that um, by taking cores that the GI is normal in G, in which case, then we see that G mod GI is a, is a solvable group. So, um, because each GI mod GI plus one will be, um, will be abelian. So you have a sequence of abelian extensions. So it's a, a sol so that's where the, um, the soluble term comes from. Rational means that you're factoring sort of through the, um, the rational uh, homology of the group. So you, um, the group that's, uh, the homology that's not torsion. That's what, um, that's what this um, <clears throat> comes from. So not all um, residually soluble groups are are reefers. So it's a, it's a very strong form. In particular, you have to start with a group that has positive first Bay number if it's finally generated. If you have a subgroup of a reefers group, then it'll also be reefers. So um, it's inherited by subgroups um, because of this strong form of residual solubility is, is um, inherited. It's an easy exercise. So examples are free groups, surface groups, and um, well, Z to the N, and then free products of these groups. So um, when I originally came up with this condition, these were sort of the only examples of groups that I knew of. Um, uh, so for a, a three-manifold group whose fundamental, three-manifold whose fundamental group is, is reefers, then this condition is equivalent to existing a sequence of covers. So we have M and then it's a cover, M1, M2, et cetera such that each MI plus one is obtained from MI by taking a finite sheeted cyclic cover. Uh, well, I said um, you have these abelian, uh, these subgroups that correspond to abelian quotients. So this is sort of the Ga Galois correspondence. Covering spaces correspond to subgroups. So the fundamental group of MI will be uh, the GI, which is in this, um, this sequence of subgroups. And you take a cover that's dual to an embedded non-separating surface. So if I have a non-separating surface in the manifold, I can um, take a, a cyclic cover dual to that by, say, cutting along it, taking some number of pieces and gluing them end to end to form a cyclic cover. So geometrically, that's what that corresponds to. <clears throat> and um, each of these guys, the um, will, pi 1 of mi plus 1 will, cut, will come from a factorization of pi 1 of mi to z to z mod k for some k. So this condition implies that the group has uh, what I call virtually infinite bedding number. So in, in other words, when you take this sequence of M's, the, um, the, if I take GI modulo its commutator subgroup, the rank of that group um, are tensored with Q. So uh, 
the, the first pairing number of that group will grow unboundedly, except if, uh, if the group is already abelian, like um, Z cubed, like the fundamental group of the three torus. So, um, so this is a very strong condition uh, on, on a group. Uh, so what I proved in 2007, then, is you have a three-manifold who's aspherical, like a hyperbolic three-manifold, and its fundamental group satisfies this residual solubility condition, then, um, then the manifold has a finite sheet of cover that fibers. In particular, one of these MIs that I um, indicated on the previous slide will, be, will, will fiber over the circle for some I. So uh, the proof of this theorem makes use of the suture manifold theory that I alluded to earlier of, uh, of Dave Gabay, uh, this method for studying foliations. So the idea is roughly that you, you try to foliate the manifold by products as much as you can, and there's a certain obstruction that ends up lying in the commutator subgroup of, of the group. And um, what re the reefer's property allows you to do is pass to a covering space where this obstruction eventually vanishes, and then you can, um, you can get something that's closer and closer to being foliated and eventually gets foliated. So using the suture manifold theory, that's sort of a, <clears throat> a rough outline. But no, it doesn't. Uh, but to get, when I first came up with this condition, I didn't have any examples of M, non, nice examples of M that satisfied it. Um, so I knew it for like free groups and a few other things, but not for closed three manifold. So um, you, you need something more in order to, to get ex actual examples. Um, <clears throat> and then recently there's. Uh, there's a self-contained proof that was, uh, oh, well, I'll also use a suture manifold theory by uh, Friedel and Kitayama if you want a, a survey of this. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so that's a summary of the properties of groups that, um, that I find relevant for uh, three manifolds. Uh, of course, these properties can hold for much broader classes of groups. And um, the interesting thing about this theorem, I think, is that um, this condition, the reefer's condition, can hold for a much broader class of groups than, um, than virtual fibering. So um, you could state an abstract version of virtual fibering, which is that if you have a group that has a homomorphism to Z whose kernel is finally generated, then you could say that it's virtually fibered. So that's Stallings proved that for manifolds anyways, that's sort of an analog of, of fiber, virtual fiber, of, of fibering. And, um, but that condition is too strong to hope for, for in, in general. So most four manifold groups probably don't have that property, for example. Whereas this condition, the reefer's condition, is, is um, something that turns out to hold much more generally. And then you can induce it to subgroups. In particular, if you, if you can embed a three manifold subgroup into a group that has this property, then it inherits the property. So that's the, um, why this turned out to be useful. All right, so now I want to transition to uh, discuss the relevant geometric group theory in order to be able to state Wise's conjecture. Is there any questions so far on the, on the three-manifold theory? The properties are locally extended, residually finite, and this reference property. That's right, yeah. And I, I think I talked about some other uh, properties last, the, the sort of virtual properties in the last lecture. <clears throat> Okay, so um, now I want to talk about hyperbolic groups. So um, but first, let's discuss Cayley graphs a little bit. So if we have a finally generated group, G, we can take a generating set, G1 through Gn. And then the Cayley graph with respect to this generating set is a, is a graph with the vertex set is the, is the group G. And we have an edge between two elements if they differ by multiplication by one of the generators. Um, and you can regard this as, an, as a directed graph or just forget the direction and, and look at it as a, as a graph. So the degree of every vertex is going to be 2n. And we can regard this as a metric space by letting the edges have length 1 and then taking the path metric. So the distance between, for example, 1 and g will be the smallest product of generators or their inverses that, that gives us g. And um, the, the invariance under action, the left action, if we multiply on the left by h, that doesn't affect the, um, that, that takes edges to edges, because edges are multiplying on the right. 
And so um, we can measure the distance of any element to the identity, then we can measure the distance between any pair of elements. <clears throat> so it's, the metric is invariant under the left multiplication by the group. Okay, that's the Cayley graph. So here's a picture of the Cayley graph of the two generator free group. Uh, so this is, a, this is an infinite tree, and every edge, every vertex will have degree <coughs> 4. Be, uh, you have the, the outgoing edge and the incoming edge labeled by A, and then outgoing and incoming labeled by B. <coughs> so geometric group theory, then, is a study of properties of groups, which they obtain, in some sense, from the properties of their Cayley graph thought as a, met, as a metric graph. So... This notion sort of originated with work of Dane on the word problem for surface groups, um, but was in some sense um, studied by Milner, uh, studying the growth of, of balls in the Cayley graph of groups as a function of the radius. So, for example, in the free group, if we take um, the ball of radius R around the identity, then um, the, the growth of that will be on the order of 3 to the r. So um, we say that this group has exponential growth. And um, Milner showed that, uh, in fact, that a group has exponential growth. This property of having exponential growth is independent of the generating set. If you chose some different set of generators, then you get um, the same exponential, you get exponential growth of the balls. The exponent might change, but the fact that it's exponential um, is independent of the generating set. And you can, um, you can estimate how the growth of balls for in one presentation versus another changes. Um, so, I must say, it was around when these ideas came out, and they were in an epiphany, because before that, groups were capital letters, G and H, and elements were little Gs. I had no idea. And then suddenly, they become geometry. So you can study theory with geometry. It's like a tremendous change the viewpoint, you know, from yeah. algebra and combinatorics or something to geometry, picture. That's yeah, that's, um, I think that's sort of the power of this is, yeah, applying geometric ideas to, to studying groups. Um, it's so simple, too. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, so, so what, uh, what Dennis, I think, is indicating is, so if, if you have a group acting properly co-compactly on a metric space, then you can, um, you can obtain properties of the Cayley graph, geometric properties of the Cayley graph from geometric properties of the space that it's acting on. And um, for example, if the volumes of balls in the metric space X grow exponentially with R, then the same property will hold for the Cayley graph. Um, and uh, this holds, for example, in um, the universal covers of compact Riemannian manifolds with negative curvature, like hyperbolic three manifolds or hyperbolic n manifolds, for that matter, that are that are compact, um, or other sorts of negatively curved spaces like uh, complex hyperbolic or quaternionic hyperbolic or whatever flavor you like. <clears throat> now, um, in around '84, Cannon realized that. Um, the Cayley graphs of these hyperbolic manifolds have, not only do they have exponential growth, but he, he found a nice recursive way of combinatorial structure for describing um, the, the balls of radius R, some kind of recursive structure, it's, um, which was eventually encoded in the language of uh, auto automatic groups. Um, they're encoded by certain automata, finite state automata. Um, and then this was extended and sort of generalized by Gromov. Um, so Cannon was interested in hyperbolic manifolds. Gromov realized that this held more generally for a class of groups which he, which, which he named hyperbolic groups. Um, they're also called delta hyperbolic groups or Gromov hyperbolic groups. Uh, but um, this, these generalized free groups and, and hyperbolic manifold groups. So... Um, as an example of the Cayley graph and how it relates to the manifold, if we took a surface fundamental group, then the Cayley graph gives, um, well, the Cayley graph is you take uh, this graph here, say ABCD, that um, presents the um, fundamental group of the surface and obtain 
you take an octagon, identify opposite sides, or identify sides in pairs, and um, you get the surface this way. And now, if we look at the universal cover, then we see the Cayley graph in, um, well, it's a, if it's a Riemann surface, the universal cover will be the hyperbolic plane, just the unit disk and the complex plane with the Poincaré metric. And um, you see the Cayley graph sort of nicely embedded inside of there. And the properties of the Cayley graph then are reflected in the, um, in the properties of hyperbolic space. So uh, if you, coarsely, you can approximate. So um, hyperbol any point in hyperbolic space will be bounded distance away from one of these vertices. And so um, you can use that sort of boundedness property to show that if one has exponential growth, the other one will. And you can also get other sorts of uh, property, metric properties, so namely um, Gromov's uh, pinching condition, which I'll describe now. So a, a, a hyperbolic, a geodesic hyperbolic metric space. So by a geodesic metric space, what I, what I mean is that any two points has a geodesic between them. So that's true, for, for example, for a Cayley graph, because in a Cayley graph, uh, between any two points, there's, there's only um, uh, there's, a, there's a path going between any two points, but um, there's only some bound on the lengths of paths, and there'll be some path, I mean, the, the lengths are going to be discretized, so there'll be some path that minimizes the distance between a, any pair of points. So Cayley graphs are examples of geodesic metric spaces. And this can be defined via Rip's thin triangle condition. Um, so for any points, a and B in the metric space will let brackets A, B denote the a, a geodesic, or you, if you like, every geodesic, doesn't really matter, connecting A and B. Then X is called a delta hyperbolic metric space if for any three points, A, B, and C, the geodesic between B and C will be contained in the delta neighborhood of the geodesic connecting A and B and the geodesic connecting A and C. So, um, Here's an example of a, of a non-delta hyperbolic metric space, the Euclidean plane. So if I take a triangle, um, and I, for any delta, I can take a large triangle so that the, the delta neighborhood of two sides will not contain the third side. And so this, this will not be um, delta hyperbolic for any delta. Where, um, on the other extreme, if I take a tree, a tree is zero hyperbolic. So if I take any three points, there's a unique tripod that they'll span. And if I take this edge and this edge, it actually contains the third edge. And that's, that's true for any three points inside of a tree. So trees, such as the Cayley graph of the free group, are actually zero hyperbolic. And um, a delta hyperbolic space, then, is sort of tree-like in that if you take two edges and take a delta neighborhood of the, these two edges, connecting A and B and A and C, then it will contain a delta neighborhood of the third edge connecting B and C. So, for example, hyperbolic space HN, or H2, if you like, is log of 1 plus root 2 hyperbolic. And that implies by this sort of course, correspondence that um, the Cayley graph for the fundamental group of a hyperbolic manifold, a compact hyperbolic manifold, is going to be delta hyperbolic for some delta. Remember that um, we only sort of coarsely approximate the hyperbolic plane by the Cayley graph of the surface. And so there's some, uh, the bound delta could change. But um, <clears throat> so um, it, it, that's actually, it's a non-trivial fact that it, it doesn't depend on, um, on which generating set, so-called so stability of, of uh, quasi-geodesics in, in hyperbolic space. But um, anyways, it, it, it it's true that if you sort of change things by some bounded amount in the metric, then um, it'll preserve this delta hyperbolicity condition. So um, if we have a Cayley graph of a group that's delta hyperbolic, then G is called a Gromov hyperbolic or just a hyperbolic group. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is the, so we're interested in this class of groups because it includes closed hyperbolic three manifolds and um, Properties of delta hyperbolic groups then will, will be satisfied by these manifolds. So Gromov proved many different properties of these groups. Um, there's a compactification of the Cayley graph um, called the boundary at infinity of G. Um, it turns out it's independent of the, the graph or which generating set you choose. You always get the same boundary at infinity for the group. So here's an example in the free group. So if we take the Cayley graph of the free group, um, even just embedded in the plane like 
like drawn here, then the boundary in infinity will be this Cantor set that consists of the limit points. So the way that you get the boundary is you take the origin and you take rays going off to infinity. And there's an equivalence class on rays. If two rays stay bounded distance apart, then we say that they're, um, th they're in the same equivalence class. And this equivalence relation then gives us the boundary at infinity. In fact, in the free group, it's not just equivalence classes of rays, it's actual rays. Um, there's a unique ray in each, in each equivalence class, and so we can just uh, compactify by that space of rays, and we get this Cantor set that um, compactifies uh, the free group. It's the boundary of infinity of the free group, and it, doesn't, it turns out it doesn't depend on which generating set you choose. And the group will act naturally on this, but from its action, left action on the Kähler graph. <clears throat> Um, so now I want to talk about subgroups of delta hyperbolic groups, and there's sort of a, a corresponding theory of uh, uh, geometrically finite groups in the Kleinian group case, like these quasi-Fuchsian groups I was describing yesterday. So if we have a subgroup of hyperbolic group, then it's, um, we can regard it as a subspace of the Cayley graph just by looking at its, the vertices inside of the Cayley graph. G, uh, uh, the, the, the vertex of the Cayley graph is just the group G itself. Then we say a subgroup is 2k plus 1 quasi-convex. If for any geodesic connecting points in that subgroup, in the Cayley graph, it lies in a 2k plus 1 neighborhood of the subgroup. So schematically here, H is just, I'm going to draw schematically as this plane. And I take uh, two points inside of H. I can actually just work from the identity in any H because it's all left invariant anyways. And um, if I take a geodesic in the group that connects those points, in the big group, yeah, thanks. In G, or in the Cayley graph of G, then it should stay within a bounded distance of the subset H. So if I take longer, longer and longer geodesics lying inside of H, uh, sorry, point, pairs of points lying inside of H that are further and further apart, the geodesics connecting will still stay bounded distance. So this is a weak version of convexity. If it was convex, that would say a convex subset is a subset such that every geodesic connecting pair of points lies in that subset. This is saying that's almost true, just the, the geodesics stay a bounded distance away from that subset. So where does the 2k plus 1 come from? Why, why all this? Oh, <laughs> you know what, I, uh, I stole someone's picture, and this is the, this is the um, you could use whatever number you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, the actual number is, so then we talk about quasi-convex, if it's 2k plus 1 quasi-convex for some k. But um, I just didn't uh, change the font there. Um, any integer. Any integer, yeah. Or any number. Any, any K is a number. K is a number, yeah. <laughs> Can't be negative, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Actually, most of these slides I've stolen from other people, so I, um. <clears throat> I did draw a few of them, though. Okay, so, um, so we say then that H is quasi-convex if it's quasi-convex um, for some constant in the Cayley graph, for some generating set. And again, it's a basic fact that for, at least for a hyperbolic group, then this notion is independent of the generating set. So if I chose some other set of generators, then um, a subgroup that's quasi-convex with respect to one generating set will be quasi-convex with respect to some other generating set. So the examples are, uh, motivating examples then of hyperbolic groups well, fundamental groups of negatively curved manifolds, but actually, more generally, Kleinian, of compact manifolds, more generally, the Kleinian groups that do not contain z-squared subgroups um, turn out to uh, also be delta hyperbolic groups. Th those, though, can be fundamental groups of non-compact manifolds, but nevertheless, it turns out that they're, um, they're always uh, delta hyperbolic for some delta. And then, uh, motivating examples of quasi convex subgroups are quasi fuchsian surface groups, such as the fundamental groups of um, <clears throat> these Kahn Markovich surfaces. So, in a three manifold, even in like a fuchsian group, so if you had a subgroup, a surface subgroup that preserved a circle in the boundary infinity of hyperbolic space, then that would be a quasi convex subgroup with respect to any generating set. What's uh, that if you have a Fuchsian subgroup of a hyperbolic three manifold group, it's quasi it's quasi convex. It's sorry, it's quasi Fuchsian and there and therefore it's also quasi convex. So those are so the motivating um, example. So quasi convexity is, is a generalization of quasi Fuchsian or geometrically finite. Um, 
So in 2008, I proved with uh, Groves and Manning, and it was extended by Martinez, Pedrosa, and Manning to uh, show that if hyperbolic groups, in the sense of Gromov, are residually finite, then Kleinian groups are locally extended residually finiteness, re residually finite. So in particular, uh, if we knew that hyperbolic groups are residually finite, then, um, then that would solve uh, Thurston's questions about the, the virtual, um, virtual Hawken. Oh, we knew, I guess, it took a year later before Kahn and Markovich's work came showing that um, there's lots of surface subgroups. So it might be possible then to show that hyperbolic three manifold groups are subgroup separable by showing that Gromov hyperbolic groups are residually finite. However, it seems quite unlikely for this approach to work because, well, it's generally believed that there's non-residually finite Gromov hyperbolic groups. This is a big open problem. Um, if, you, if you could find a non-residually finite Gromov hyperbolic group, you know, it would be, um, you'd be on your way to tenure somewhere. Or, um, and although it turns out that Gromov hyperbolic groups satisfy, like, every every criterion we can get for um, residually finite groups, it turns out you can also prove it for Gromov hyperbolic groups. So somehow we haven't been able to find any non-residually finite. So the word problem is solvable in Gromov hyperbolic groups? The word problem is a very, yeah, very quick solution via automata. Um, it's an automatic group. It, via, yeah, that's essentially what Cannon showed in his work. Um, yeah, so there are Gromov hyperbolic groups which are not linear, so you don't get if you have a linear group, you get a solution to the word problem because you're just multiplying matrices together and you see whether it's a trivial matrix or not. But uh, there are Gromov hyperbolic groups that are not linear, but there are none that are known to be not residually finite. So anyway, so this, uh, this approach, even though um, it's not clear if this, is, this works, uh, we, we were able to use some of the techniques then to, to prove um, in, in certain cases that this, sort, this technique works. Okay, so now um, I need to discuss uh, <clears throat> cat, uh, cube complexes, in particular cat zero cube complexes. So this notion of hyperbolic groups was introduced in this paper of Gromov um, in around 87 in uh, MSRI publication. Um, he, in the same paper, he also introduced this notion of, of cube complexes. So um, a topological space that is, is locally cat so cubed, if it's a cube complex, so it's, it's like a simplicial complex but made out of cubes. And um, here I mean n cubes, hypercubes or whatnot. So uh, you can make this into a metric space by putting a standard uh, Euclidean metric on each cube. And um, it's locally cat zero uh, if this gives a locally cat zero metric. So I'll state in a, um, well, I'll state an equivalent form of cat zero. A very scary word. Right. What does it mean? Um, yeah, so cat zero um, stands for Kratyadori, Alexandrov, Toponogov. Um, yeah, I, I'm mangling the names. Apologize. What do they call that sample? What do they uh, see as what? Kratyadori, Alexandrov. Uh, so there's, there's various, there's cat one or cat minus one. Um, for this, case, uh, cat zero, it turns out to be relevant. Um, it just means it's... Yeah, I'll explain it in a sec. So it's a non-positive curvature. Um, it's a compare... What does it mean, though? I know it means... It's, you, you look at a triangle and you compare it with the Euclidean triangle of the corresponding um, same edge lengths, and the, the distance from a vertex to the opposite side in your triangle should be less than or equal to the corresponding distances in the Euclidean plane. That's the... Um, but what Gromov found, though, is that there's a, an equivalent condition, a purely combinatorial condition that I'll give. So, uh, namely, that the links of the vertices are flagged. So if I take the uh, uh, cube and I chop off a little corner, then I get a simplex of one lower dimension. And so th if I take the link of a vertex, that's just, you'd, you get that by sort of chopping off a little neighborhood of a vertex, and that's going to be a simplicial complex and what Gromov observed that those should be flag complexes. So I'll state that on the next slide what that means. But I wanted to mention that in a, in a cat zero cube complex, there are what are called walls or hyperplanes, which is what's important um, to me. And um, what you do is you take your cubes, and each cube will have a mid, 
some number of midplanes. If it's an n cube, it'll have uh, n co-dimension one subcubes by um, taking the coordinate sort of axes. And if I have a mid cube in one cube, I can extend it in the next one, even if it's a different dimension, to a mid cube in the next one. And then you just propagate along. So you can regard these hyperplanes, another way of regarding this is an equivalence class on edges. Two edges are equivalent if they're on opposite sides of a square. And if I take the equivalence relation generated by that equivalence being on opposite sides of the square, then I get the uh, hyperplanes or the walls in a cube complex. So you can start in any cube, take a midplane, and just keep extending it, and you get um, and you get a, the the walls in a cube complex. Uh, now in a in a cube complex, though, with which is not cat zero, only locally cat zero, these can come back and intersect themselves. So these might not be embedded. In that case, we regard them at the double points as being um, distinct. So it's we're not sort of gluing the midplanes together if they happen to get glued up. Um, globally. Uh, so uh, here's another example of... Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, so I'll state the... Yeah, that's... Um, so Gromov's condition is that if you see, in the link of a vertex, if you see the one skeleton of an n simplex, then there's actually an n simplex there. So if I see a triangle, then there's actually a triangle there. But that triangle is the corner of some cube. So if I see three faces of a three cube, then there is actually a three cube there. So that's Gromov's link condition, and it corresponds to that the, the link of a vertex is a flag complex, namely that it's determined by um, the one skeleton. Namely, if you see the one skeleton of a K simplex, which is a K plus one complete graph, a K, K plus one clique, then there's actually a K plus one simplex there. So any gra if you hand me any graph, I can c create a simplicial complex out of that by, by throwing in a K, K simplex for every K plus one click. And that's a flag simplicial complex. And so what Gromov's criterion says is that the space is cat zero, or locally cat zero, if it's a cube complex where all the links of vertices are flag. And so this is an example of a... Um, so a triangle means three edges forming a triangle. That's right. Oh, okay. And if, I, if you see the um, one skeleton of a tetrahedron, you, you see all the, the triangles there, and you'll see the four triangles, and then you have to fill that in with a simplex. So there's actually going to be a, a four simplex there if you see a tetrahedron. What is that? You, what is oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, this is a different, another terminology for, um, so MPC is non-positively curved, um, or locally CAD zero. Uh, Again, I stole this slide from someone that uses the different terminology. So, um, but this just means locally CAD zero. Uh, here's another example. <coughs> this is um, a two-dimensional complex that tiles the hyperbolic plane. This is topological. Well, it's made of squares. They're not looking Euclid very Euclidean here, but you could, in principle, put a Euclidean metric on each one. And then the link of a vertex is a five cycle. And that's, um, that's a flag complex because you don't see any triangles there. So as long as you have, so in the two-dimensional case, it just means that the, the girth of the graph is at least four. You don't see any, um, if it's two, you have a two-dimensional square complex, two-dimensional cube complex that's CAD, was locally CAD zero, if and only if the links of the vertices are, are graphs that have uh, girth at least four. So um, the hyperplanes, if I insert all the hyperplanes into here, then I get this sort of dual tessellation of hyperbolic space by these pentagons, but these are, the hyperplanes are actually these lines that, that go, um, that extend to infinity. Okay, so, uh, so that's Gromov's um, notion of a cat cube complex. Now, uh, we say that topological space is cubulated if it's homotopy equivalent to a compact lo uh, locally cat zero cube complex. Um, and uh, Oh, yeah, so, locally, so Gromov's link condition is equivalent to being locally cat zero. Then if it's locally cat zero, its universal cover will actually be cat zero. So if it's simply connected and locally cat zero, then it actually satisfies this global triangle comparison condition that defines cat zero. And um, Gromov proves a sort of local to global principle. If it's locally uh, cat zero, then it will be globally cat zero. So locally cat zero, you only have the triangle comparison for small triangles. Right. That's right. And yeah. 
So it's like a local version of a, uh, it's, it's like a cartan, cartan hadamard theorem. That if you have non-positively curved sexual curvature in a Ramani manifold, then it's universal cover. Um, the exponential map is, is, a, is a diffeomorphism and it's non-positively curved. So actually, yeah, so cartan hadamard manifolds are actually examples of cat, locally cat zero spaces. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, space is cubulated if it's homotopy equivalent to a cat zero cube complex. And so I'll be interested in three manifolds that are cubulated. <clears throat> uh, so the reason I only want homotopy equivalence here is that um, it's actually, I mean, you could ask for a three manifold, is it actually have a cat zero cubing? So locally cat zero cube complex decomposition of the manifold. Well, uh, even. Okay. Cat zero in this, right? Sorry, uh, say again. You want to include cat zero? Why is any just so think of the previous thing about oh. homotopy equivalence? About homo yeah. So why is just a, um, a topological space homotopy. that's homotopy equivalent to a, lo a, a locally cat zero cube complex? I see it. Um, so in particular, it'll be aspherical. So these cat zero cube complexes, the the universal cover is contractible from this. Um, Cat zero condition. Uh, so, in particular, um, the, th the manifold or the space Y itself will be um, will be aspherical. <laughs> so, actually, Tao Lee showed that there's certain hyperbolic three manifolds that don't admit they're not homeomorphic to an any cat zero cube complex. So, uh, that's in some sense why I only want um, homotopy equivalent. <clears throat> So there's a theorem then of Sagiv, uh, his thesis at UC Berkeley in their, uh, with Andrew Kasson in 1995. He proved that um, if you have, well, a, a special case of his theorem says if you have a three manifold that contains an immersed pi one injective surface, then you have an action of the fundamental group of that manifold on a, a globally cat zero cube complex. So by globally cat zero, then I mean just cat zero. It's simply connected and locally cat zero. So um, what Sagi's construction does is it gives a cube complex in which each hyperplane corresponds to uh, an immersed essential surface, or rather a lift of that to the universal cover. Um, and in the case of a geometrically infinite surface, for example, Sagi's construction will give it rise to a crystallographic group. So if you have a, a three-manifold that fibers over a um, circle, then what Sagi's construction gives you is just the action on Z. Z is a cat zero cube complex, just tessellated by squares. And um, Sagi's construction would just give you an action on, on um, Z, or an R f uh, factoring through uh, Z. So um, the, actually going back to, uh, to this picture, what Sagi's construction does, if you're given, so in one lower dimension, if you're given a bunch of lines on, um, so you're given some curves on a surface, and you look at the universal cover, you see all these lines here. Um, what Sagi's construction gives you is the, a sort of dual cube complex where you put a vertex in each complementary region, and you connect up, you see a cube, whenever you see two hyperplanes meeting, you see a little dual cube there. So in two dimensions, you just see a dual square. And you connect all these squares up to form a tessellation. Now, um, you have to, this, this works in this case. You get something cat zero. But in general, you might have triangles in the complement, and it's going to fail the flag condition. So what you have to do is sort of throw in higher dimensional cubes to, to make things flag in locally cat zero. Um, so here's an example of that. Um, so here's. Now, a tessellation, again, in the two-dimensional case, I have, a, test, I have a, um, a bunch of lines in the plane, in the hyperbolic plane. Uh, this is coming from the modular pattern. And um, so I can throw a vertex in each complementary region, and I connect them up. Um, but the, if you apply Sagiv's uh, construction here, associated to each of these uh, vertices, degree, three, uh, uh, degree six, or there's three lines coming through here, you'll get a dual um, three-dimensional cube here. So the hyperplanes for these cubes will correspond to these lines. So uh, this is an example, then, of uh, how 
how Sagi's construction works in, in, this, in this example. So, Are there examples where the cube complex that you create in this way has arbitrarily high dimension? Uh, yeah, so... Um, yeah, there's, there are examples. Uh, so it turns out in the three-dimensional case, if you're working with surfaces, the cubulations turn out to be finite dimensional. But um, there, there, are, there are examples that are, have unbounded. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, there are actually there are certain three manifolds that will have unbounded. These, um, these certain graph manifolds of Rubinstein and Matsumoto that I mentioned the other day, uh, they, they would have infinite dimensional cube complexes associated with them. But they're still ca locally cat zero. Um, but yeah, that, that can happen. So you, there, there is a certain um, non-triviality condition that you, that you want on the, on the action of the group that I didn't really state that says that any hyperplane is sort of, there's some group element that will take a hyperplane off of itself. So you get some non-trivial action. Otherwise, um, it might just be some kind of permutation action on vertices of some infinite dimensional cube, which is sort of uninteresting. But... Sagi's construction actually produces sort of non-trivial actions on cube complexes. Um, but all the, all the ones that come up in the three-manifold theory turn out to be finite dimensional. Okay, so uh, anyways, so Sagi has this general theory of um, associating cube complexes to, um, to co-dimension one um, things inside of uh, spaces. So there's a, there's a general theory of how to do this that... Um, <clears throat> so uh, that Bears, Run, and Wise then used to show that closed hyperbolic three manifolds are cumulated, and what they used are these surfaces of Kahn and Markovich that are um, very close to being totally geodesic, <clears throat> and um, these give rise to accumulation. So their criterion says that if so, if you look in the universal cover of the manifold, you look at in hyperbolic space, you look at any pair of points in the hyperbolic plane. And you ask, is there some surface that separates those points? So Kahneman Markovich can provide surfaces whose limit sets are nearly circular. And so um, and they, they go sort of anywhere you want in the manifold. They're um, arbitrarily close to being totally geodesic. So, you, so this property um, holds from their, from their condition. So you can find some quasi-Fuchsian surface, well, here's, this one's not very circular, but anyways, it separates the endpoints of this geodesic. So for, for any pair of endpoints, if you can find some surface in the manifold, a lift to the universal cover will separate those endpoints. Then the action um, on, so, so Guy's construction has, gives you an action on a cube complex, and then this condition shows that that action is actually um, c proper and co-compact. And so you get a, a cubulate, an action on a cube complex that um, is going to be homotopy equivalent to your three manifold. But this cube complex might be much higher dimensional, but it'll still be finite dimensional. Why do you want this? Yeah, why do you want, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, <laughs> Sagiv in his thesis. Uh, so this always means cat zero cubulation, right? Yeah, so cubulation means you're homotopy equivalent to a cat zero, locally cat zero cube complex. And that cube complex is, there's a prescription of Sagiv's that produces this cube complex. So basically what happens is any time two of these surfaces cross each other, you get an associated square in the cube complex. And if you have a triple of surfaces crossing, then you get a, a three cube. And if you have n surfaces crossing simultaneously, you get an n cube. And then Sagiv's cons construction prescribes how those cubes are glued together, which is slightly non-trivial. You use... Um, Ultra filters on the wall space associated with these. It's it's a little involved, but um, in some of the vertices you don't see sort of directly from complementary regions, which is why it takes a little care. But so you, you you start off with a with a group that's acting on something that's really negatively curved in the in a very traditional sense, and now you want to kind of get something to it's to a, to a to produce a, a space that it acts on that's kind of mostly flat but still is negatively curved. It's non-positively curved. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's uh, so you start with something negatively curved, and now something you have something non-positively curved. So it might seem like we're not making progress because uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So that's that'll be the next topic then. Why why this is interesting. So they, they're the substrate for sort of um, solving this problem of getting them to s sit inside nice groups and, and inherit properties from those groups. So that's, that, th these groups are the right-angled Latin groups. 
Uh, I wanted to mention that there's before the, this work of Bergeron and Wise, there were many examples of cubulated hyperbolic free manifolds, in particular manifolds that are homeomorphic to a Cadzio cube complex. So this picture and on the, um, the cover of Thurston's book shows an example. So here is a tessellation of hyperbolic free space, or part of one, and there's a cube complex dual to this. So you put a vertex inside each of these dodecahedra and you connect them up. You see around, the vert uh, around a vertex here, there's a dual cube, because um, these are like coordinate axes. And um, these cubes fit together to form a, a cube complex in hyperbolic space. And the, um, you can also sort of see these hyperbolic planes here, that those are the hyperplanes that are dual to the cube complex. So it's exactly like that two-dimensional picture I showed earlier of the pentagons in the plane and the dual um, squares with degree 5. So there's a, this is a three-dimensional example. So there were, um, before this theorem, there were many known examples of this sort. And H. S. M. Rubenstein had showed this. Uh, like alternating link complements had these cube complexes and various other things. Yeah, so um, because the link of the vertex is going to be an icosahedron, and um, you see in icosahedron in every triangle, there's a tri the, every, every um, three edges that. that oh, icosahedron. Icosahedron, yeah, dual to the dodecahedron. And um, you see these triangles are filled in by the cubes that are dual to these vertices. Yeah, good question. Okay, so the, the reason that I'm interested in these cube complexes um, then is that they'll enable us to embed these three manifold groups into right angled Artin groups and then inherit all the nice properties of these right angled Artin groups. So that's, um, that's, that's why I'm interested in that. Um, let's see, I guess I just realized, uh, I guess I'm out of time. Maybe this is a good time to stop and um, I can continue from here in the, in the next lecture, if that's, um, if that's okay. So um, I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Questions? What is a right angle arm group? <laughs> <laughs> have to come to the next lecture. No, yeah, so you have, uh, if you, you have a graph, and you have generators um, corresponding to the vertices of the graph, and if there's an edge, then we say those two generators commute. And um, it's pretty simple. So if you have the, the graph with no edges, it's a free group. The clique will give you uh, the abelian group, because every generator commutes with the, every other one. And so these are sort of a, interpolating between free groups and abelian groups. And you get free, they're closed under free products and things like that. Why is it called right angle? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So the, the fact that these generators commute is um, the sort of lift of the right angled uh, reflection group condition. So if these guys also all, all had, if we also said they had order two, then it would be a right angle reflection group. Uh, it's an Artin group because um, these are sort of generalizing the Artin relations that occur like, for example, in the braid group. But the braid group relations, there's the commuting ones in the braid group, which are like this, but then there's the, the ones that are lifts of order three um, dihedral groups of order six, I guess, in a, in a reflection group that correspond to the Bray groups so that are the central extension. So uh, these groups um, have been quite, they're quite simple to define, but then they have nice properties and they're inherited by, like they have the reefers property. So if you can embed a three manifold group into one of these, then it has the virtual fibering condition. So that's why I'm interested in, in, these, gr in these groups. And the cube complexes will give us a way of embedding um, at least up to find index three manifold groups into these groups and then inheriting their properties. So that's sort of a summary of what I'll talk about tomorrow. Yeah, sorry to go over. Other questions? Well, why don't we uh, thank Professor Nagel again and then don't go because we need to handle the dinner arrangements. <laughs> <laughs>